Hey everyone, it's uh, David Barnett from davidcbarnett.com, the blog site, YouTube channel, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play podcast, where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses. This week, I have a special guest from Jasper, Alberta. We got Jamie Irvine, who's come to join us, and he is a business coach that works specifically with contractors and heavy equipment type businesses. We're going to get a little bit into his past, but I wanted to have Jamie come on today to talk about what business success actually looks like. Um, Jamie, thank you and welcome to the show. Glad to be here. I wish I lived right in Jasper. I can see Jasper from my window, but it's still about a two hour drive, but I'm halfway between Edmonton and Jasper and it's a beautiful part of the country. And I like, I uh, really like being here because my family's here and that's really important to me. Cool. Um, why don't you give us a little bit about your background? How did you end up being a coach to, uh, the specific type of businesses that you're talking about, maybe you can give us your specialty and then give us a little bit of your background. Well, it seems that when we were kids, we were neighbors because I grew up in uh, New Brunswick. I lived on a, a 132 Mill Road. I still remember the address. <laughs> and uh, I moved uh, out west when I was 17, right out of high school. I've been working three jobs and I saved up money and uh, chasing a skirt, chasing a girl. Uh, but I wanted to also experience living in a large center and Vancouver seemed like a, a great place to go. So I landed in Vancouver and uh, took that summer basically off. I did a little bit of work here and there, odd jobs. And then I got into the heavy duty parts business with a small remanufacturer in that area. I was 18 years old and uh, that was 10 years of uh, learning that business. Cool. And, and then you, you got your own contracting business up and going too. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about that? Yeah. So it was 2009 and the world economy was collapsing and I thought it'd be a great idea to give up my solid job and go start a consulting business with a business partner. So that's what we did. And about four months in my business partner, after, of course, this is after I invested every dime I had into it. Mm -hmm said, uh, I don't like the work we're doing. This isn't what I want to do. And what he wanted to do just didn't jive with where I wanted to go. So, you know, we're still friends to this day. We had a very solid business plan and we had a very solid uh, contract between us. So we basically just opened the contract, turned to the right page and said, okay, when this happens, what did we agree to do? We all did that and we're still friends, but it did put my wife and I in a bad position. And basically six months from the day I started this business, it was bust. We tried to keep it going for another six months, but we needed to make money. I was mm -hmm. down to $700. I had, I had a $1,200 house payment to make in two weeks. I had a young family and it's like, what do you do? So what any good entrepreneur does, we started a second business. We had an <laughs> opportunity to, uh, to partner with someone in a, you know, more just a, of a, a subcontractor to a general contractor agreement. He loaned us some equipment, gave us some training. I spent my last $700 on a trailer so I could get the equipment to a job site. And I was cleaning gutters and power washing and learning that business, the exterior building cleaning business, which is huge business in the West and down mm -hmm down that side of, uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest, the Gulf area. Because of all the moisture in the air. That's right. There's so much moisture. Yeah. Buildings literally uh, mold and, and, and the, they'll just rot if they're not cleaned. So it's big business and we learned it. We learned it quickly. And I was moonlighting as a, as a consultant while gutter cleaning and power washing and doing exterior building cleaning to pay the bills. Okay. And so you were able to, and, and because this ties into our topic here today, you were able to turn that business into something that you could run remotely because you ended up wanting to move to be closer to family, right? That's correct. And one thing that I did very early on is um, I looked at where this business took the average contractor. And understand, I, I had been in heavy duty parts and manufacturing. I had gone into national sales account management. I had been in the white collar side of a blue collar industry. And suddenly I'm the one out there physically cleaning gutters, power washing. And I hated it. Hmm. I absolutely hated it. And I looked at guys in their mid fifties and their bodies were worn out and they couldn't escape the gravity of their business. They just, they just kept doing it, doing it, doing it. And they weren't able to, to ever get out. So my wife and I, had been really interested in Michael E. Gerber's, you know, 
excellent work. Uh, his book, The E-Myth, was mm -hmm. transformational for us. And we applied the concept of building systems within the business. We very quickly hired two employees, which was really important because I actually got hurt in a workplace accident, couldn't work for six months. And our business was able to continue on. And we knew we had something at that point. And so we applied ourselves for a total of six years. And we got to the point where we actually packed everything up. We moved a thousand kilometers away, 600 miles to the to the neighboring province of Alberta. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is where our, our family lived and we wanted to spend time with them and we ran the business remotely. So you see, what I learned online though is that business success is having a mansion with the two Lamborghinis. And and so you're telling me that success for you was being able to have a business that produced an income and then having the freedom to pack up and move and still run that business because of the systems you put into place from a thousand kilometers away. Well, here's the thing about the mansion and the Lamborghinis. <laughs> I think a lot of people automatically assume that those people own those things outright. They've made yeah, millions of dollars. They put cash down. Uh, reality check everybody out there. That's like nine, you know, 99.99999% of people are not in that position. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people who are fronting that that's what they've got, it's an illusion. The people who actually live at those places and maybe drive those cars are probably leveraged in debt so much and are under so yes. much stress. And they probably work 80 to 90 hours a week. Some people love it. That's what they're built for. They, you know, they are designed as a human being to do that. Mm -hmm. but that's not me. And that's not most of the people that I've met in my 22 year career. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because you, you talk about the Michael Gerber book. One of the books that was very informative and formative for me that I read probably 25 years ago was uh, Dr. Stanley's millionaire next door. Have you read that one? I have. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I tell people the punchline to the book all the time is that if you want to become a millionaire, you just have to figure out ways to not spend a million dollars, which is not exciting. There's no, there's no fancy cars or fancy houses in that plan. Uh, but that's the reality of how people become wealthy is, is by not having these flashy things. Um, but at the end of the day, sometimes even quantities of money are not necessarily how people define success. So you know, in your work with your clients, how do you begin this pathway? Do you, do you make that definition before you start working with them on their business? Well, the first thing that I always want to talk to people about is, is the design of their life. Mm -hmm. Like what's important to them. And what I often find people tell me is they'll start off by describing something that they've seen online. They'll describe Gary Vee's life or they'll describe Tony Robbins life or Oprah or they, they'll, they'll grab on or gravitate towards someone who has had massive success and they'll describe the lifestyle they think those people are living based on what they see, you know, through digital platforms. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we, we have to have a, a talk about that because first of all, I don't believe most people really think it through and they don't listen to what those people say. Gary V gets up at six in the morning and he works until 11 o'clock at night and his wife had to beg him to take some holidays. Hmm. Now, if that's you and, and that works for you and your wife and your family, then you're probably not talking to me anyway, because you're already doing it. But most people, that's not what they want out of life. So I always start with, let's design your life. Mm -hmm. What is the overarching life goals that you have? And then let's build a plan that actually will produce those results. So in my wife's and I case, we started off with a simple idea. We wanted freedom and flexibility. And we understood that in order to get freedom and flexibility, we were probably going to sacrifice some revenue. And we were okay with that from day one. And we built a plan around that concept, which eventually over many years led to us moving back home and being with family. But we didn't know that at the beginning, but we had an idea. And I think that's the beginning point of let's do some due diligence to understand what do these people's lives actually look like, the ones that we are wanting to emulate. Let's mm -hmm. break it down. Let's, let's look for the cues. And is that, first of all, are you capable of doing that? 
Second of all, do you even want to do that? Is that the life that you imagine when you imagine these people? There's often that very large disconnect. But what I is encouraging is that it's not hard to de construct the lives of these people that we look on to, you know, that we, that we want to emulate online. It's not hard to deconstruct, but it does sometimes take someone to just walk you through the process and ask a few questions and get you thinking in the right way. And, and do you, what kind of reaction do you get from some people when they realize that, you know, the grass may not be greener to, you know, to use that old expression? Well, you know, and there's, there's two Two yeah. dominant uh, react, two dominant reactions. Uh, the first one is a little bit of depression because a lot of times people have spent a lot of time really dreaming. You know, they've they've bought into this idea that they can just dream it and it'll just come into existence. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, "Well, wait a minute. If that dream isn't reliable, then maybe nothing I think is." And so there could be a little bit of sadness about that. And then once they realize that okay, that means that I need to kind of think outside the box here. I need to build my own life. They, they fall into the, the things we've been taught. And it's like, you don't have to do it that way. <laughs> there, there's nothing wrong with building uh, a plan that is different, that is unique, that, that really just fits you. And a lot of times we get into things where parents and grandparents and siblings and friends they almost uh, oppose it. I know we got a lot of opposition until people understood what we were doing. And then all of a sudden, they were proud of us. But for the first few years, it was like, oh, yeah, they're, they're doing this thing out there. And I don't think they make very much money. And da, 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 da. <laughs> so it, it, it's definitely a process. And it, and it is an emotional one where you do have a bit of that roller coaster until you get comfortable with the concept. And then once you do, you start to see a larger picture and you have something that I think is more meaningful to work towards, which I think gives you energy and, and power. And then you go after it and you start to see the pieces being put into place. And that's really encouraging. So then it does have a positive, but it, it, it's a long process. It's that hockey stick curve. It's very flat for a long time. And then at the end, it takes off. Even I didn't know that. The first five years of the six years I own my business, I asked myself, what am I doing? for, you know, every three months. Um, but then all of a sudden, when we hit that critical point where it really came together and took off, all of a sudden, then it's like, oh, okay, I get why I put in five years of hell. <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, that that misperception, you know, created by often like social media and online stuff a lot of the time. Um, I had a great example of it this summer. And, and I'm becoming very aware of these topics for uh, my kids because they're getting to the age where they're starting to have Instagram accounts and participate with this online stuff. Uh, this summer, we were in Vancouver, and there's a famous landmark there called the Steam Clock. And it's purported to be a steam-powered clock. I don't know if it really is or not, but um, it toots. In, every in Gastown? Yeah, in Gastown. And okay. every hour, it, it sings a song with, with uh, steam pipes, you know, like uh, organ pipes. And it's, and a lot of people come to check it out. And a lot of people, of course, stand in front of it and take a snapshot. Uh, we had lunch there across the street. There's a little, little terrace outside and we sat down to eat and, and across the street on the opposite corner to the steam clock, this crew of people showed up and there was this woman who I, I think she was like an, a professional Instagram person. I didn't, I didn't recognize her. I'm not on that platform very much. There's an Asian woman. She was obviously in a very expensive dress and she was trying to have this photo taken of her, you know, time at the steam clock. They were there for 45 minutes. They probably took over 200 photos. There, there was the photographer, there was her, there was someone else who kept handing her accessories and things. And I kept pointing it out to the kids. I'm like, you know, someone's going to see her picture and they're just going to think that she floats through life in this fabulous moment all the time. When in reality, um, she's working and she's working hard to get that one image that's going to make everyone think something about the way she lives. And it's just not true. Yeah, I totally agree. The other thing that you should be wary of is even if you get this right once, don't automatically assume you're going to get it right for the rest of your life. Because when I exited and I started podcasting, I emulated my 
whole podcast after John Lee Dumas of EO Fire. I was episode 1769 on his show. I took his course and I made a fundamental error in assuming that I could somehow recreate what he did in 2012. And I was like, wow, this is an insane amount of work. I don't know how he did it seven days a week for five years. I mean, he did it full time. And I was, I was doing it part-time, but I, I fell into that trap and I had to wake myself up out of it and be, and realize, no, 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 I'm, my name isn't John Lee Dumas. My name is Jamie Irvin and I do things my way and I do things differently. And it took a little while to course correct. Now, of course, when you have the experience once, it's easier to catch yourself and get back on track. So you can imagine what 15 year olds are going through when they spend all day watching Gary Vee, nothing against him, good advice in a lot of ways but they're getting the wrong impression of what it takes to be successful. Well, and, and I want to bring you back to something you said about time and timing, because, you know, for somebody to enter the world of online media today, even if they do everything that, that John Lee Dumas did in his experience, it isn't necessarily going to have the same results because when he did it, he was he was earlier on that growth curve and there weren't as many, you know, business discussion podcasts in those days. And so he was able to benefit not just from what he was willing to do and the work he was willing to put in, but the fact that he was in at such a, at that earlier point, right? And and this is one of the things that uh, that frustrates me is because I often have people come to me to say, "Hey, you know, look at this example," and I'll say, "Well, yeah," and it's that example is probably a hundred percent true. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can copy it, right? And and it's funny actually just today i was writing an email to my to my email list about survivorship bias which which is about the fact that a lot of the times when you hear about something in the world of business you're hearing from the survivor you're not hearing from the person who tried to do it and failed a lot of those people aren't aren't out there sharing their story you're just you're hearing from the people who managed to make it through oh 100% and the other thing that is important to remember is that like I benefited from being an early adopter. So in 2009, 10 and 11, I was an early adopter of Google AdWords Express, Google AdWords. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in early in my niche and we did very, and it wasn't just that I was in early on those platforms and those ad campaigns, I, you know, platforms. It was that I was the first one in also my geographical area. So it was across many different categories. It was, I was an early adopter of a ad platform that really not a lot of people were using at the time. I was in a niche vertical of business in this exterior building cleaning business that most people were like, doesn't, doesn't like kids on the weekend make extra money doing that. And then I was also <clears throat> first in, in my geographical area and our business grew 25% over, you know, every year compounding. Now I couldn't do that in 2019. Like, there's no way. I, I know what's going on in, in that area and everybody is doing that. We were also first in on a, on a particular kind of service for a roof treatment, which put us head and shoulders above everybody else for two years until everybody copied what we did. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. recreate that today. I couldn't start that business today with $700 and do what I did in 2009 and have an exit six years later. It would not work. So that's on a small scale. So now you, you, you stretch that to the, to the macro scale of someone who's doing, you know, tens of millions of dollars in sales online and digital sales or, or information products, or they're a media agency. So, and they've built this huge social media platform and you come in and you say, well, I see what they're doing in 2019 and I want that. Mm. And it's like, okay, but they started in 2003. Yeah. And nobody knew who they were. Have you ever gone back and listened to Gary V's original videos when he was doing the wine? Like he was horrible, right? I went back and listened to episode one of John Lee Dumas. He was terrible. Like worse than me when I did my first episode. I guarantee you that. I, I leave my old stuff on too and nobody goes to watch it. I, I go no. and I check and the numbers never change. And yeah. The reason I leave them on there is, is because I, every once in a while I have someone come along who says, oh, I want to have a channel like yours. And I'll say, go back and see how I started, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's exactly what you're talking about. You know, you, it's, it's that, uh, you know, an overnight success five years in the making Yeah, is the expression so, you often hear. So now people are 
thoroughly depressed because they're like, well, wait a minute. I can't, I can't be the next big thing. Yeah, that's what you're telling me, right, guys? And then on top of that, you're telling me that everything that, I, that, that people tried 10 years ago doesn't work today. And that obviously means there's no more opportunity. But that's not true. Hmm. So here's an exercise in just looking at who you are, what makes you unique. So what makes me unique? I'm from the Maritimes. I worked really hard as a kid. I worked in the fields picking potatoes. I had three jobs in high school. I moved myself across the country. I survived in Vancouver as a 17 year old on his own. It was not easy. I went through hell until I was 25 and my personal life destroyed everything about my personal life, was divorced, bankrupt, the works. Um, Even developed a drug addiction that was very serious. Now, I have a baby. I never knew my dad. He took off on me. There was no way I was going to take off on my daughter. 25, it just wakes you up. You know, 25 is a magic age. You young men listening, just wait till you're 25. You, you, you won't be an idiot anymore and you'll have a little bit of life experience and you'll actually stand a chance. <laughs> so that's my background. Then professionally, I'm in heavy duty parts most of my career, about 60%. And I got into this contracting thing. So fast forward to 2019. And I'm going, what should I do? What, what should I do? Where is the opportunity? So then I looked at my background and I realized, wow, there is no podcasts dedicated to heavy duty parts for the commercial trucking industry in existence. There's a few trucker podcasts. There's a couple manufacturers who have a little bit of, uh, you know, this is our product. Look at us. Mm-hmm. But nobody has built a show dedicated to that. So in June, I launched a new show. Now, I have done 144 episodes on my business podcast, and I've done 12 episodes on my heavy duty parts podcast. And here's the results. My business podcast is at this level, and my heavy duty parts, now that's after 144 episodes and interviewing some big name people like Michael Lee Gerber, like Dory Clark, Bob Berg, Mm -hmm. John Lee Dumas. You know, I've had some success with it. In 12 episodes, I've got three quarters of the results in the Heavy Duty Parts Report podcast that is dedicated to that niche. Because so, you're exploiting something underserved. You're, you're almost, you're dialing the clock back for yourself because you're going someplace that other people aren't going. Exactly. Yeah. And so if you follow that same process that we're talking about, what do you want out of life? Hmm. Figure that out first. Then who are you? What's your background? I could have gone into addiction. I could have gone into how to recover from divorce. I could have gone into a whole host of subjects on the personal side. I could have also gone into the things I'm experienced in on the business side. I chose that business subject that was underserved and I found an opportunity in 2019. People think things like podcasting, oh, it's too late. Forget about it. There's only 750,000 shows and of those 750,000, only 19% of them have published a new episode in the last 90 days. Yeah. Pod fade. Lots of opportunity. Yeah. So it's really about taking this process that we're describing and figuring out for yourself, what is it that you want? Mm. How are you going to get there? And where can you exploit something that's not been touched yet? And if you do all those things in that order, I think you're going to find that you're going to have some very nice experiences and you're going to see a pivot in your life direction. And hopefully things like satisfaction and happiness and meaning will rise in your life. And that gives you energy. That gives you power. That gives you the ability to be more turned on to the idea. And every day when you go to do that thing that you do, you're going to approach it with a different, from a different place. And Mm -hmm. people respond to that just like you're responding to what I'm saying right now. Yeah. You know, in in my audience, we have people who are, it's primarily people who are looking to buy businesses and sell businesses. And um, in a lot of the work that I do through the materials in my online courses, my group coaching program, what we look at a lot is we look at self-analysis, but, and we look at before and after the deal before and after transaction states. So, you know, what are your, characteristics attributes with respect to earnings and and savings and vacation, et cetera, before a deal versus if you did this deal, what would it look like? Right? Because again, that lifestyle goal that what does my life look like has to be paramount. 
if you buy a business that, you know, if, if you're looking to be working 30 or 40 hours a week and take three weeks of vacation in a seasonal business where you get to go down south in the winter or something like that, and you buy a business because the numbers look amazing, but you're going to end up working 70 hours a week, it's not going to take long before you're really dissatisfied with your decision. And nothing will kill a business faster than an owner who's decided they don't like it. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden now you're not sending out the right vibes to your employees. You're not doing those little extra things that, that owners need to do to help a business grow and thrive. I know for me personally, it was, it was pretty simple. You know, I, I went through a divorce and I made the decision that I really didn't want my kids to have to go to daycare. And so how could I take everything that I'd been through, you know, and I had I'd closed down a business brokerage office how can I take everything that I know and, 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 you know, the demand that's there because people are calling me, asking me for help um, and turn that into a business where I can be home at three o'clock every day. And, and so, you know, I, I built the whole thing around that very simple kind of goal. Uh, and then it's gone from there. You know, that was just step one. And now it's, it's moved on, you know, now it's more about even creating experiences for the kids, taking them on trips and, and things like this. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, it's funny when, when I took the kids on the, on the train trip this summer, we were three weeks on the train trip. Some of my emails out to my email subscribers were about the trip. I got so much feedback from those emails and the majority of the feedback were, was from guys who were in the 50 plus category and they were all almost the same. They were all Dave, what a great thing you're doing. I wish I had done more of that when my kids were blank, right? And, and it was just validating for me because I'm like, yes, I'm on the right path. I, because you, no one wants to have regrets, right? Oh, a hundred percent. When it comes to talking about pe uh, to people about the exit of a business, you know, this is something that I don't see a lot of people spending a lot of time on. It's actually why I rebranded my business podcast to how to start, grow, and one day sell your business. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. And everybody, you know, is it's such a struggle to build something from nothing and to start it and then to grow it and then to manage it. And it's, it's just, it takes a Herculean effort. But a lot of times people don't think about how they're going to get out. Yeah. And they feel the vast, maj vast majority don't. Yeah, they feel trapped by their lives and they feel trapped by their businesses. And so one of the things that I like to talk about is after we talk about designing that life so that you don't have too many regrets and hey, let's be honest, you're still going to have some. How do you see the other end of this journey? Hmm. And how do you design that from the beginning? And people say to me all the time, oh, well, we can't do that because we don't know. We don't know what the numbers are going to be. We don't know this. We don't know that. And then, okay, that's true. But it's, it's amazing as human beings, when we visualize something, suddenly that's where, what we see all over the place. Uh, there's a part of the brain that, that filters everything that comes in. And, and, and a great way to, and everybody's had this experience. You go to buy a car, suddenly you see that car everywhere right? Well, that's your brain no longer filtering those images. Your brain recognizes, oh, you're about to buy this car. It's now important that we see that car. So when it goes by, we recognize it. It's no different in business. If you have a vision for, okay, how am I going to build my life? How am I going to build my business? And how the heck am I going to get out of this thing when it's over? Then if you have that in mind, you start to see and you start to hear things and you start to meet people and things happen. That's how I got out with mine. It was a long relationship. It was, it was basically three years of just talking to a guy off and on about what we were doing. And I always thought he will never be the guy. He will never be the guy that buys this business, but I want to have that conversation so that I can start to think about that and I can start to find that guy it did turn out he was the guy and it, it, it came about in a, in a way that was unexpected. And I know some people, especially if you're more analytical and you're not uh, as, you know, your, your personality is maybe a little more focused on those details and you're not uh, as open to new ideas. You might think to yourself, that's a little bit, uh, it's a little soft. It's not really easily measured, but I can tell you from personal experience, I've had that experience over and over and over again. And it is such a critical, important part. And there's another reason because we all are our own bottlenecks. 
I don't care how good you are. You could be Tony Robbins or Gary V or Oprah. There is something that they are doing that's holding whatever they're doing back. You know, Tony, Ma Tony Robbins might be a $6 billion man, but there's something about him that's holding him back from being a $10 billion man. And it's the same with you. And I always talk to business owners about that. You got to recognize your, your abilities, but also your mm -hmm. limitations. And it's really critically important to get out of the way so that your business can go on to serve the people it's designed to serve. And we did that. And that was a little bit, it was a little hard to kind of admit, but it was like, yeah, I need it. It was time. I needed to step out of the way. And that business has three X since I did using the systems I built. So I am the origin story. My wife is the origin story. These people bought it and carried on with it. And uh, they've impacted a lot of people's lives. And, you know, and I always point people's attention to the value of what you're doing. You think, well, you were a gutter cleaner. Yeah, but we kept 60 year olds off the roof. And when they yeah. fall and break a hip, it destroys the rest of their retirement. So I think we were doing something that contributed to the world and made the world a better place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Jamie, if, if there's anyone out there who thinks that uh, a, a further conversation with you might be helpful to them, how do people find you or if people want to become listeners of your podcasts? If you go to jamieirvine.ca, that is where everything happens. Uh, right on the homepage, there's a spot where you can book a 15 minute call with me. We can talk as well. Uh, there's a spot on that website to subscribe to the podcast. If by chance you're in the heavy duty trucking industry, then you can go to heavydutypartsreport.com. Cool. And of course, I'm going to put those uh, URLs in the show notes for anyone uh, who wants to be able to click on them later. Uh, Jamie, it's great to meet a fellow Maritimer um, who's doing really well in business and realizing his goals and being successful. And thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for providing the platform to be able to share my story and talk about things I'm passionate about. It was wonderful meeting you and I look forward to having you on my podcast. Yeah, no problem. All right, everyone, you know where to find me. I'm at davidcbarnett.com and I put that URL everywhere. It's hard to miss. So with that, we'll see you next time. Have a great day.